Hello again, thank you for clicking through to this video on my 12 reasons why a two-stroke engine may bog down. As always I'm using diagrams which I've drawn up to explain my point. I just find it a little easier to detail things this way. I realise there's already a lot of great content out there on YouTube informing us on a practical level using actual carburettors, but I can explain things doing it this way in a different way. I like to concentrate more on the general educational side of things and I'm hoping that after you've watched this content in detail that you'll be far more equipped to service in your carburettor or your engine and far more equipped to sort out anything diagnostically. As I've already mentioned I've got diagrams for you to look at but I've also got moving animations so let's get stuck in. Now whether it be on a garden strimmer or a chainsaw etc Whenever we pull the throttle and we get that bog down sound, that oh, it's always caused by an insufficient amount of fuel reaching the engine itself. And the reason the machine will generally sit there idling no problem is because it's getting enough fuel for the level of engine speed. And as soon as we try and increase that speed where we need more fuel, we're not getting enough. So as soon as I hear this, I realize there are many reasons for the cause, but the first thing I do before I do anything else is I check the mixture screws and therefore the mixture screws are my number one. I'll check these before I check anything else. This is the high and low screws, the fuel air mixture screws on the side of the carburettor. The H of course means high for the engine's high speed adjustments and the L means low for the engine's low speed adjustments. Now I have got videos on this channel explaining how to adjust the high and low screw and how they are used to tune in the engine itself. So I won't go back into that in too much detail now because that's a video in itself. Instead I'll keep it to how these screws can relate to bogging down of the engine. Starting with the H screw or the high screw, we can see the screw head there, the adjustment head, and then the actual screw itself we can see goes into the carburettor. It then protrudes into the high jet where the fuel comes from above in the metering area. And if you could see that point there, the end of the screw actually protruding into the jet itself and blocking off part of the fuel. So because of the screw's restriction, there's less fuel here below the screw than there is above it. So if we turn this screw in even more, we'll restrict the fuel even more. And if we turn the screw out, we'll let more fuel down. And in a nutshell, that's all the high screw's for. It's to put in a metered amount of fuel, which ultimately ends up in this area of the carburetor, the inlet area, and is then drawn into the engine for combustion. And the L screw or the low screw works in pretty much the same way. Other than that its design is to meter the amount of fuel for the low revs. So in the same sort of way the low screw protrudes into the low jet where the fuel is restricted below the screw itself. And the screw can be turned in and out to meter the amount of fuel as required. Now I've briefly explained what they do I can better explain now how problems with mixture screws can cause bogging down. Usually, but not always, any problems with mixture screws and bogging down is due to incorrect settings. Now, if the mixture screws are set correctly, we'll have a good ratio of air to fuel in the inlet there. The fuel there is shown as red dots and the air there is shown as blue arrows. And the fuel there is separated into little molecules because it's been atomized, what we call atomized, by the air rushing in through to the engine. So it's nicely separated the fuel there, so it's ready to be burnt in the engine for combustion. Now if these mixture screws were screwed too far in, and they were restricting too much of the fuel, therefore supplying too little fuel from the high and low jets here, then of course the obvious effects of that is too little fuel coming into the inlet area here. And now we're left with an insufficient air to fuel mixture ratio. The main jet itself is still open, and it's allowing some fuel to come through, but it wouldn't be enough to allow the engine to run at full speed. So this could be a classic example where an engine would run at low or idling speed, but as soon as we pull the throttle, it does the bog down there, oh, because we haven't got enough fuel there to support high revving engine, but we could support a low revving engine possibly. Of course, I'm only speaking in general terms here to explain my point. There could be some variations, but in general, that's the way it is. So what we need is correct mixture settings to allow a good air to fuel mixture and plenty of atomized fuel there in the inlet so it can go through into the engine for decent combustion. So if my mixture screws are all okay, the second thing I'd check, if my engine was still bogging down, 
is, believe it or not, my fuel tank. Not the tank itself at this point, but I would look into the tank at the fuel filter. And I'd be making sure that the fuel filter is clear with no blockages, so it's not restricting any fuel. In the past I have removed fuel filters and cleaned them slightly and blew through them to see if there is any restriction there, but I can't recommend that to everybody because of the potential dangers of fuel contact in the mouth. So what I tend to do nowadays is always have a fuel filter on standby for the price that you can get them for, just a couple of pounds. It's best to have one on standby so that you can just replace it anyway. Of course there's just simply the option of removing the fuel filter for just a few moments and running the machine again, of course making sure that there's no dirt at the bottom of the tank that would suck up into the carburetor. But of course then it would eliminate whether it's a fuel filter issue or not. But of course if the fuel filter is blocked we can see the issues there. We can see it's not drawing in fuel down in through the fuel pipes there and it's not going into the carburetor. Therefore when we try and rev the engine up we're going to get a small amount of fuel if any. And if it runs at all, it's quite likely to bog down. Now another cause of bogging down I've had in the past relating to the fuel tank is the fuel tank cap. That's because when the engine's running and it's drawing fuel out of the fuel tank, it has to allow the fuel tank to breathe. So explaining that a little further, when the fuel leaves the fuel tank and goes into the engine, it draws down above it. And it's like a vacuum. The more fuel that leaves the fuel tank, the more air it draws in above it. And as shown here, it's usually a special one-way valve in the fuel tank cap that allows the air to come in to the top there of the fuel. Now when these valves fail to work, which is something I have come across a few times in the past, the fuel can't leave the fuel tank because there's like a vacuum lock there. There's no air coming in to replace the lost fuel. And the effect there would be kind of like if you had a large syringe and you had no needle on it, of course, and you put your finger on the top of the syringe and try and draw back. You wouldn't be able to do so. You wouldn't be able to pull back. And if you did manage to pull back and let go, it would spring back upwards. And that's because of the vacuum, the air drawing it back up because there's no air coming in to replace the air you're trying to draw back out of the syringe itself. So the vacuum lock's created and actually pulls back up at the fuel, just like when we pull back at the syringe and it springs back up. So the obvious effect of this is less fuel getting into the carburetor. That of course could contribute to bogging down, but eventually of course it would stop the engine completely. As we can see that's down to fuel starvation and all because of the fuel tank cap, which is unfortunately sometimes overlooked. So what I've done in the past, if I've suspected that the fuel tank cap is at fault, I've just undone the fuel cap slightly to allow air to come through, so to allow it to breathe. So it's doing the job of the actual valve itself and then run the machine again. If it runs OK, then it could be your cap. And it's just a case then of replacing your cap and all should be OK. But if my mixture screws are OK and everything in my fuel tank looks OK, I would then check my fuel pipe. If, of course, my engine was still bogging down, I would just check the external parts of the fuel pipe, the parts I could see, because they're going to be the parts that would draw in air. As well as losing fuel out of the pipes, which you'd see, obviously, because the engine's drawing in fuel, sucking in fuel, if you like, it'll also suck air in through that rupture, through that gap in the pipe. And, of course, at this point, we've got air coming into the carburetor unnecessarily. And that will affect the correct fuel to air ratio coming out of the carburetor and into the engine and so can cause the engine to bog down because we may have enough fuel for idling speed but not when we use full revs. But if all's okay here as well the next thing I'd check is the inlet manifold and I'd check firstly to see if it's loose. Now to better explain my point on this one I need to turn the carburetor around to a different angle. So I'm going to turn it around so we can see this side of the carb. So just turned one quarter of a turn so we can see the side of the carburetor with no fuel tank and no engine. So there we go, the plain old side view and the inlet area or the venturi area is there in the center where you can see the blue arrows going through representing the airflow going through the carburetor and into the engine. Okay, let's put this into perspective now and add an engine. So there we go, We've got the engine there and at the moment there's no inlet manifold added as of yet. But that will be added very shortly. But for now, let's drag this into the center so we can see things a little better. 
Now the inlet manifold sits between the carburettor here and the engine. So there it is. It's kind of like a spacer between the two and it's generally made of a hardened plastic. And on this side there's generally a gasket between it and the carburettor. And it's the same story on the other side between it and the engine. They then fit together like so and the gaskets each side create the seal. And when they are all together like this there's a continuation of the inlet hole that goes right through the carburettor continuing through the gaskets and the inlet manifold and through to the engine. So that's there between these two points here. And as I've mentioned continues through here through the manifold and into the engine. And they're all held tightly together with a special long bolt shown here and that continues right through the carburettor itself right through the manifold and it screws into the side of the engine there so it keeps everything fast together. There is an air filter that usually fits on the carburettor this side to obviously filter out the air coming into the carburettor but I can just explain my point a little easier without showing it there. So as a general explanation then this is what we've got going under normal working conditions. There's air coming into the carburettor this end through the air filter of course and then it enters through the Venturi and at this point the fuel is added to the air shown as the red arrow there coming from the fuel jets as it enters the Venturi which as I've already mentioned the amount of which can be adjusted by the high and low mixture screws here but when the fuel enters here it mixes with the air and it becomes a fuel air mixture which continues down the rest of the carburetor and through the inlet manifold before coming out into the engine where it's used for combustion. Now one problem that can arise is when this bolt here, the retaining bolt, is loose. Everything's okay at the moment because it's tight. It's holding the carburetor and the manifold onto the engine and it's keeping those two gaskets in the middle there airtight. It's allowing them to be airtight. Now if it's loose we obviously lose that airtight effect and we get gaps there between the gaskets. And those gaps there allow air to be drawn in there where it shouldn't be. And of course this will all have a dramatic effect on the air to fuel mixture that reaches the engine itself. And all that's happened is that that retaining screw has just come loose slightly. So let's just recap what's happening now with the air fuel mixture. As usual we've got air entering the carburetor here, obviously coming through the air filter. It then continues down the carburetor into the inlet area or into the venturi area but at the moment it's still pure air. So at this point fuel's added to the air and that's a metered amount and it now becomes a fuel air mixture. So we've got the fuel air mixture there heading towards the engine and it's just about to go in through the manifold but when it gets to the manifold it's met by this extra air that's being drawn in here at these gaps and because of that there's too much air here in the fuel air mixture. Now up until this point the fuel air mixture was correct because of the metered amount of fuel going into the air and that was correct for engine combustion but what we've got now is too much air coming into the engine than fuel so it's a weak fuel mixture and adjusting these mixture screws here to add more fuel won't compensate for this problem. So because the engine's receiving an air to fuel ratio that's weak in fuel then there won't be enough fuel there to support the amount of combustion for a high revving engine. So this is when bog down is likely to occur. Generally then in this case if this bolt is loose then it's just a case of tightening it up. You can actually hold on to the carburetor and try and move it up and down slightly to see if there's any movement as well to see if it's loose. But just get a screwdriver and just make sure these bolts are nice and tight. If they're not they can always be tightened. There are some less common problems like the threads damaged as it goes into the engine but thankfully not too often. Now the next thing I'd check and something often overlooked in terms of bog down are the manifold gaskets. Now let's just say that the retaining bolt there is nice and tight and we've got everything working okay with the carburetor. We've got the correct amount of air and fuel coming through and into the engine. So no problems with everything fixed together there. But what can sometimes happen is this gasket, either this side or the other side of the manifold, can sometimes degrade or become damaged in some way. And despite the fact that everything's fixed together tight, as I've said, if this gasket's damaged, then air can be drawn in once again. And similarly to what we've already seen, as soon as this air starts to be drawn in, it actually messes around again with that fuel-air mixture. 
And again, we've got too much air to fuel ratio. And when it actually enters the engine, it's that ratio again that causes bog down. Either gasket could fail, by the way, and that could be just down to degradation or it could be physical damage. And we're not really restricted to problems with just the gaskets. The manifolds sometimes themselves can be damaged and draw in air. And of course, the problems of that are the same as what we've already seen. We've got extra air coming in there into the manifold and that's playing around with the delicate ratio of that air fuel mixture. So by the time it gets to the engine, we've got less fuel there in the ratio of air to fuel mixture. And of course, that causes bog down. And damage to the inlet manifold can be anywhere. So it's a case of just having a really good look around the inlet manifold. If everything else you've checked is okay, and you've been through the processes so far, just take a good look at the inlet manifold. You can undo the main screw, the main retaining screw, and have a good look at the inlet manifold, and it's well worth doing so. But if everything was okay with the manifold, and I was still getting nowhere, I would check the fuel pump diaphragm, my number five. Now, before I checked the fuel pump diaphragm itself, which is obviously inside the carburetor, and it's the bottom diaphragm there, shown in green, I would actually check the cap that keeps the diaphragm in place. And it's this screw here that keeps that cap up tight in place and holds the diaphragm in place. And when this screw's nice and tight, obviously keeping the cap onto the carburetor nice and tight, everything's working as it should be. We've got the fuel coming in from the fuel tank, entering the carburettor and it's being used inside the carburettor there going into the venturi as air and fuel mixture and all's hunky dory all's well generally it's down to one screw to hold this cap on and hold it on tight enough to get the correct function of the carburettor but what can happen is and this is something i have come across in the past a few times is that cap can become loose and that's because the screw beneath it holding it on has become loose and that causes then a gap between the cap and the main body of the carburetor. Now, if this happens, there'll be excess fuel spilling out at these points, of course. But what will also be happening is air will be drawn into the carburetor. So it'll fill the carburetor up with air. So there'll be air and fuel in the carburetor where there should be just fuel. And the air will work in through into the carburetor, something like what's shown here in the animation. There'll just be a continuing, constant supply of air there coming in through that area and the result of that is too much air here coming into the inlet area of the carburetor through to the engine and again we've got a fuel to air ratio here that's weak in fuel so there's too much air to fuel so at this point the engine would most likely bog down that's if it runs at all and again it's all because of this cap slightly loose because this screw's slightly loose allowing air to fill up all the way around these fuel vanes and up through the top here and down into the engine. This same effect incidentally can be brought about by a cap that's damaged. So even if it's nice and tight and the screw's nice and tight holding it there, if there's damage to the side of the cap, it can draw in air similarly and cause the same sorts of problems. But the fuel pump diaphragm itself can also cause problems with bogging down. Of course though, when it's operating okay and everything's working as it should, there's no problem whatsoever. But problems can occur mainly when the diaphragm ages or when a substandard diaphragm is used. So here's the fuel pump diaphragm. And if we take a look at that valve there, it's opening and closing the way it should do. And the right amount of fuel is coming through so that the venturi can be filled with the right amount of fuel air mixture. So when these diaphragms do age or they're made from a substandard material, what happens is they go stiff and rigid and of course when the diaphragm goes rigid so does the valve because that's part of the diaphragm and if you look at the valve now it's not opening up as much as it did the fuel flow coming in can't move it so far because it's more stiff so now if the engine revved to high revs it wouldn't be able to get enough fuel for what it needs and you can see there there's a lack of fuel coming in through that valve there so now we're left with a restriction of flow of fuel going through the carburetor and you can see these important areas emptying like the fuel pump area here and it's a big problem now because the fuel pump area has no fuel to pump now even though there is a restriction of fuel here there might still be enough flow to support idling speed but as we increase engine revs and put more demand on for fuel, then it will be drawn out of the inlet of the carburetor by the engine much quicker than it can be replaced because of that restriction. 
So all of these fuel veins now will just continue to be emptied as the fuel's used. And as you can see, there's plenty of fuel coming from the fuel tank. But regardless of this, you can see that the fuel veins continue to empty, all because of the restriction there on the valve flap. And we've got to a point now where there's no continuation of fuel here, feeding the metering area and of course eventually the main jets. So when the engine tries to draw in fuel, there's no fuel available to be drawn in. And that results in big consequences of course, because all we've got now is air being drawn into the engine and very little fuel if any. Just like you can see there, we've got more air going in than fuel, a lot more. And there's not a very good ratio there of air to fuel mixture. In fact, it's a very weak mixture. So when the throttles open fully for high engine revs, this amount of fuel wouldn't support that amount of revs. And what we end up with is bog down. The engine stops. This kind of restrictive defect can happen on any of the valve flaps on the diaphragm, by the way. I only use the first one as an illustration, but they can be any. Another area of a fuel pump diaphragm failing issue is this area here. This is the actual fuel pump area of the fuel pump diaphragm and it relies on a good range of movement up and down to allow for good pumping action. I've just moved the fuel out the way of the diaphragm here by the way just so I can explain things and show things a little better of the diaphragm's movement. But when all's working correct there will be fuel there. So when this area ages and becomes more rigid it reduces the pumping efficiency of the fuel available for the engine because we haven't got the same freedom up and down, the same degree of movement there, which allows the pumping action. And the obvious result of that is a lack of fuel getting up there to the inlet of the carburetor that's available for the engine. And if it runs at all, when we try and increase the engine revs, there won't be enough fuel there for it and then bog down. But rigidness and aging, etc., isn't the only thing that can affect the fuel pump diaphragm. If there's any damage to this area, so if there's any holes in it or any kind of trauma, then fuel will escape through and of course the pumping action then will be reduced again. At this point the only remedy really is to replace this diaphragm for the price that they are. They're not difficult to replace and as long as you've got the numbers off your carburetor or off your machine you can normally ring a supplier and get the correct one. But if all's well with the fuel pump diaphragm and going through the key steps the next thing I'd check for is fuel vein blockage. As we know now, we've got free flow of fuel here on these fuel veins that work the way right round the carburetor and up into the venturi where it's used in the engine. But when that free flow of fuel is interrupted by debris or dirt of some kind, then we've got problems. Just an example, we've got some dirt here that's come out of the fuel tank and somehow come past the fuel filter. Now, although it's only a small piece of dirt and it's not causing any problems here in the fuel line, by the time it's past one of these valve flaps, and if it doesn't get stuck here, it's heading for the fuel vein where it could do. And in fact, that's what's actually happened here. Because this fuel vein is so much smaller, if you like, the orifice is so much smaller than the actual fuel pipe coming from the fuel tank, then a tiny piece of debris can block it. And that can often be a piece much smaller than you can usually see. So this area is now blocked, but the engine's still wanting fuel. So it's still sucking fuel out of the carb. And of course, this is what happens. The carb's cleared out with fuel. So now we've got a problem, and that's a lack of fuel going into the engine. In fact, none at all. So in order for it to get to something like this, the engine would have bogged down and stopped, of course. Now the blockage might not be here, of course, because this is only an illustration. It could be here, or it could be at this point, or any of these points here. If you do suspect this kind of blockage here in the fuel veins, then the best thing to do is strip down the carburetor and blow down the fuel veins with an airline or an air blower. And hopefully then we can remove the blockage. I have come across many situations where the blockage can't be removed doing this. And a common thing nowadays is to use an ultrasonic cleaner that can loosen the dirt first. So you could have that option also. In the past with stubborn blockages, I have put them in boiling water and soap and left them in there for a few minutes, maybe five minutes. And then I've had another go with the airline and sometimes the blockage is removed. And I put that down to obviously the boiling water degrading the debris somehow. But that's just what I've done. Obviously, I can't advise you to do the same, but I can just tell you I've done that and it's worked. But if you are going to do that, please be aware that there are 
sometimes rubber or plastic components on your carburetor that might ruin. We can even get a blockage here at this point and in my experience this is one of the more common areas for blockages. This is a metal gauze strainer filter that the fuel passes through on its way up to the venturi and it's there to remove particles of impurities out of the fuel itself. So this is an area of blockage because of that and it's the build-up of such particles that cause this blockage and if the fuel is a little dirty of course this will be one of the areas to start blocking up first but these can be removed and easily replaced they're generally quite inexpensive and they're easy enough to get hold of if you just do an internet search with your details of your machine or the details of your carburetor you should easily get hold of a gauze filter but in the interest of the blockage there you can see the result is the same the fuel's been used above the blockage and now we're left with no fuel going into the engine and no working engine. Now let's take a look at another area of the carburetor now and how any deficiencies in that area can cause bog down. I want to focus in on this area here. This is the metering area of the carb. Now if we quickly jump back to small amounts of debris and blockages, we can see that small orifice there underneath the needle valve and its seat that wouldn't be too difficult to block. And it's vital that the fuel passes through there in order to get above to the metering area. But if we do get a blockage there, then obviously we know we're not going to get any fuel up to the top of the metering area. I've illustrated quite a bit of debris there, but in some cases there might be the tiniest amount of debris, the tiniest piece, and that could get stuck just there inside that very small fuel way there with the obvious consequences the same as the last point where fuel isn't going up into the metering area and of course isn't going into the venturi and it's not available to the engine and so the engine will have bogged down and stopped whereas under correct normal conditions fuel would have traveled upwards here under the valve into the metering area down through the jets and into the venturi available for the engine other areas prone to blockages are the fuel jets. This particular jet is the high jet and then the one over to the right of it here is the low jet. And whilst they do have their own obvious functions, they do work harmoniously together and with the main jet to make sure that the right amount of fuel reaches the venturi and of course enters the engine. So as you can imagine any blockages here can be drastic. So here's the main jet and let's have a look the kind of problems that can occur when the main jet gets blocked but at the moment you can see there that the fuel is coming down the main jet nicely and it's entering the inlet area of the carb there so it's entering the venturi there's plenty of fuel there atomized with the air going into the engine so all well and good at the moment and now we've got a main jet blockage and as you can see there there's no fuel coming out of the main jet at all the other two jets the high and low jet are still adding fuel but they can't compensate for the main jet which is where the main of the fuel comes from and i hope this illustration goes a long way to showing the importance of the main jet and that the high and low jet are there just to support the main jet and to fine tune the engine so this amount of fuel is totally insufficient to support the workings of an engine particularly a high revving engine that's if the engine would run at all so if the engine was running and then a blockage of this kind in the main jet occurred then the engine would bog down and stop so let's assume everything's okay with the main jet now let's have a look at problems that can occur because of blockages in the high jet well at the moment all's looking well we've got fuel being drawn out of the high jet there into the venturi and we've also got support from the main jet of fuel being drawn out there so all's looking quite well. It's all amounting to a decent air to fuel ratio, which of course equals good running of the engine. So let's imagine the high jet's blocked then. We've got a piece of debris there stuck in the high jet. And that piece stuck there is large enough to stop any fuel coming down. And you can see a different air to fuel ratio now. There's less fuel in with the air. And of course, if there's less fuel going in, the engine revs will die down. And as you can see now, we've got less air going in as well. So there's deficiency in the way the engine's running. The engine's running lower. And although the main jet on its left is still supplying fuel, and so is the low jet on its right, because all three aren't working in sync, there's not a sufficient supply of fuel for the engine, so the engine won't be able to receive 
a sufficient amount to rev right eye and of course when we try to do that when we try to rev eye we're just going to get bogged down and the engine is most likely to stop and we'll get the same problem by the way if the high screw is screwed right in as you can see here there's no debris at all it's just that someone's reset the high screw too far in and no fuel can come down into the venturi for the engine okay let's have a look at another scenario we've got everything working again here we've got the main jet supplying the fuel and the high and low jets and that's resulting in a good fuel air mixture in the inlet so that means obviously we've got a good running engine at this point but if we take a look now something's gone wrong we can see there we've got less fuel in the inlet and of course if we take a closer look there we can see that it's the low jet that's screwed right in so this has been over adjusted we've got problems there there's less fuel coming out of the low jet as you can see and that's causing the problem but again the main jets working okay and that's adding fuel and so is the high jet but because we've got no fuel supply commitment from the low jet we're left again with an inferior ratio of fuel to air mixture and that's what's going to cause problems with running with the engine and of course ultimately when we try and make the engine run to its best it's going to bog down I've actually come across times where it bogs down due to the low screw and although the low screw is associated with fine-tuning low engine revs when it's screwed in like this it does cause enough of a problem with the fuel to air mixture to cause bog down and in fact I have found this on more than one occasion when I'm actually physically repairing machinery so in order to avoid this problem or if you do have this problem the best thing to do then is when you strip down the carburetors get an airline and again squirt the airline right down these jets and of course it's good to remove the high screw and the low screw completely and squirt some air down there as well the best thing to do as well if you can't get rid of the problem then as I've said before it might be best to look into ultrasonically cleaning the carb if it is that you don't want to take it to a repair center to get it cleaned so ultrasonic cleaners are quite inexpensive nowadays and a good internet search will bring you a good deal I myself got one off the internet and it was a good price and I use it all the time it was quite cheap and I've never had a problem with it and it's always served me well and I use it most days and when I remove them from the ultrasonic cleaner and blow them out again I find that I can move debris much better as I've already mentioned and of course they don't just clean carburetors they clean things like jewelry so you might find it a worthy investment so if all was okay now with my fuel vanes and all the previous key steps the next thing I'd look at is my metering diaphragm now the metering diaphragm shown here in green is responsible for regulating the correct amount of fuel coming into the inlet area of the carburetor and when fuel is used out of the fuel reservoir beneath it it draws the diaphragm down as you can see there and when it draws the diaphragm down it allows more fuel to come through into that reservoir area and the reason it can flow through freely now is because that needle valve is now off its seat because the metering diaphragm has pressed down on the lever allowing it to be lifted off so this drawing in the fuel occurs when the pistons on the upstroke because when the pistons on the upstroke on a two-stroke engine it draws in the fuel air mixture behind it I won't go into that too much here because I do have another video already on how a carburetor and an engine work together on a two-stroke so please do take a look at that if you need to but for this video I just wanted to explain what happens there briefly and when the piston comes back down this is what we see there's no fuel being drawn in at the moment so we've got the piston up piston down piston up piston down piston up and down etc so let's look into the diaphragm then there we've got the diaphragm in green and we've got beneath it in brown the gasket and that's just to keep everything sealed up there now on this illustration I won't show the gasket going right across when the diaphragm's down like this because the diaphragm is on the edges I've shown it there on the edges and I'll just show it like that just so that we can see things a little better because if I showed it this way with it going right across it would just look a little more crowded and I just wanted to keep it as plain as possible but just to illustrate this is what these gaskets normally look like and they're designed as such that they span around the outside of the diaphragm allowing the diaphragm to come down in the middle so they've got a hole in the middle there to allow that so my point is as well that the diaphragm always sits on top of the gasket so there we go everything present all working well we've got the gasket and the diaphragm there and at the moment 
the piston is on the upstroke drawing in fuel. Now we know how it works, let's have a look at some problems that can occur. Firstly, let's just consider here this gasket and how it keeps a seal in the metering area. Now, providing this lid is nice and tight, then that gasket and the diaphragm can form a good seal in this area. Now, one issue I've come across in the past are these screws. Now, sometimes these can be slightly loose and only slightly enough that you can't actually see them loose with the naked eye. And yet it's enough to cause problems. Because what can happen, it can just remove the top slightly to break that seal, that vital seal that we need. And although I've shown an obvious gap here, the gap can be so small that it'll draw in air and we won't even see that there's a gap there at all. So for illustration purposes, I've just shown there the gaps between and we don't want that at this stage. Now what you'll probably notice if the cap is loose and there's a gap there, that you'll see fuel spilling out. But at the same time, there'll be air being drawn into the carburetor. So we won't just be losing fuel, we'll be gaining air where we shouldn't be. And so as things progress, we'll be having that air being drawn in there at the metering area all the time, as well as losing the fuel. And so what's going to happen there is that we're going to have less fuel and more air. So you can see there we've got fuel and we've got air above it. So we're getting less of a fuel line there, the tide line of fuels going down and down all the time. And we'll also undoubtedly have air mixed in with what fuel we've got up there. Now because we're drawing in air in these places that we shouldn't be, we've actually lost the vacuum there in the metering area. And it's the vacuum that we need in order for the metering diaphragm to be drawn down. But because we've lost the vacuum, it will no longer be drawn down and act on the metering lever, which will then act on the metering needle to allow more fuel through. So we've lost the fuel through altogether there. So all that will happen now is the metering needle will stay fast on its seat. And because that's fast on its seat, it won't allow any fuel coming upward from the fuel pump diaphragm area to replenish what's up there in the metering area. So all that's left is this fuel here that's mixed with air with no backup whatsoever. So all that can be supplied to the engine through the jets is this erroneous mix of air and fuel. And that of course isn't sufficient to run an engine so we'll have bogged down. If you do suspect this is happening then the remedy is quite simple providing the gasket and the diaphragm are okay. Just make sure these screws are nice and tight. Not too tight as that we can strain the threads but nice and tight. You'll soon know if it's a problem up here because you'll see fuel leaking down. So you can always try tightening these screws. Another problem, however, we can be faced with is problems with the diaphragm itself. This diaphragm is made from special material to allow it to be nice and free and flexible to move up and down nice and freely, covering a good distance there. And it needs to cover enough distance so that this part of the diaphragm here, the dowel area, lowers down enough to push down here on the back of this lever, the metering lever. And when it does, we get this. The lever's pressed at the back and it's tilted up at the front and the metering needle's lifted off its seat. Of course, then we get fuel flowing here because we've got the needle off its seat, as we can see, and fuel can freely enter the metering area at the top. And as we know, when the diaphragm comes back up, it removes itself from the back of the lever. And because it's got a spring at the back there on the lever, it pushes the needle down. So now we've got a nice tight seat and no fuel coming through which at the moment is just what we want. So let's just observe it again, working under normal working conditions. It's moving nice and freely, and it's operating at a good distance, making sure that that valve's opening. Each time the gasket lowers, which of course, as we've mentioned, ensures that there's plenty fuel supply here for the main jets in order to put the fuel into the inlet. Now, sometimes these gaskets can become less flexible and more rigid. And that's normally due to age or the gasket being made of inferior material, so non-genuine material products. And the problem with it being more rigid is that the diaphragm can no longer have the same range of motion. As you can see there, it's moving up and down nicely, but it's not moving up and down as far as it did. So it's not acting on the back of this lever and pushing down as far as it did. And in that case now, we're not opening the valve as much as we did. So that's now obviously going to have implications here. There's not going to be the same amount of fuel available in the inlet.
that's simply because we won't have the same amount of flow of fuel coming past the needle there because it's only partially open. So there's going to be less up here in the metering area, which will lead to less being available to be given by the main jet. And finally, as we've mentioned, will lead to less being available here in the inlet for the engine. Let's just take a look for a moment how this would look. So let's have a look in the middle there in the inlet. You can see with every cycle of the piston, there's less fuel coming in. So there's less available each time the piston needs to combust. And of course, eventually, there's just going to be that little that they'll be bogged down. That's if the engine runs to this point at all. Just to recap, this is a healthy diaphragm, so everything's well here. And this is again one that's gone rigid, so this is the unhealthy diaphragm. There's big differences there. So should you suspect that the metering diaphragm is at fault, they're easy enough to find on the internet and they're quite cheap. I normally buy them in a kit, so I get the full diaphragm kit for the whole carburetor and I change everything while I'm at it. And that way I know everything's okay. Another metering diaphragm issue I've had in the past is damage or punctures in the diaphragm. Although the diaphragm itself is okay and it's not rigid, it's nice and free, having punctures in the diaphragm can cause dramatic effects. Because when the diaphragm comes down, you can see there that the fuel leaks back through that little hole and goes the other side of the diaphragm. So when the diaphragm comes back up, it doesn't come back up fully. So now we've got fuel on this side of the diaphragm where it shouldn't be. And normally on the metering diaphragm cap, there's a little air hole. And the purpose of this little air hole is to act as a breather, which allows air in and out behind the diaphragm as it moves up and down. So we don't get any pressure building up of air behind the diaphragm. So there won't be a vacuum behind the diaphragm stopping it from coming down and there won't be pressure behind the diaphragm stopping it coming back up. This air hole allows the through road, if you like, of air and free diaphragm movement. One thing I want to mention before I go any further though is just to be aware that that breather hole should be open at all times. So just make sure that it's not blocked because if there is a blockage there, as I've just mentioned, it can create a vacuum for that diaphragm and stop its range of movement and we've just seen what can happen then. Now just going back to the diaphragm damage again, as we mentioned before we've got the fuel there up above the top of the diaphragm where it shouldn't be and that's going to create problems but the one thing we will see is we'll see leakage of this fuel through that breather hole there and of course the more that the machine is used the more fuel we're going to see coming out of this breather hole. So this is a good indication if you've got diaphragm damage. But because we've got the hole there, we've lost the vacuum. And because we've lost the vacuum, this diaphragm won't come down low enough to open that valve. As we saw earlier when the diaphragm was stiff, we've got the same problem now of the diaphragm not traveling down enough to open the needle valve in a similar way. And that's all because it's lost its ability to be drawn down by way of vacuum. So the result's going to be the same as the last issue. There's going to be less through road of fuel coming through, so there'll be less available for the main jet to put out into the inlet for the engine. So if you could see into the carb, this is what you'd probably see, something like this. You can see there's less fuel, less fuel, every time the piston cycles, and then eventually bog down. The remedy for this, by the way, is the same. It's a case of just replacing the metering diaphragm and as I've said, you can get them quite reasonable off the internet. Now another problem that can occur, and certainly one I've had in the past with these metering diaphragms, is with this area here. This is the plunger that's part of the diaphragm or the dowel that activates this area here on the metering lever. And this is a tricky one because the rest of the diaphragm can be identical to the correct one, but the plunger itself can be too short sometimes. And that can affect the correct space in there between the plunger and the back of the metering lever. And you can get diaphragms that look the same, but this plunger here is slightly shorter or longer. And that can produce dramatic effects to the running of the engine. So let's take these two diaphragms for example. Now they both look identical from the outset. They're exactly the same size, the same thickness, and they have the same holes as each other. And if you were to take a ruler and measure, you'd get the same size across in any direction as each other. And so to the untrained eye, you'd think they were identical and you'd fit either to your machine. But there is a difference, and to see it, you've got to look a lot closer, and it's this area here. This is that plunger I was telling you about. It's far different to the one on this side. 
because the one on the left hand side is longer than the one on the right hand side there. There it is again on the drawing and remember how vital it has to be for that spacing. So we could have dramatic effects depending on which diaphragm we fit, whether it's the long one there or the short one across here. And it's vital we choose the right one. And let's just briefly go over why. And that's because when the engine's running and the diaphragms come down to allow fuel to come out, we need that plunger to travel down just enough in order to push down on the back of that metering lever just enough so that it tilts that lever up just enough in order to open up that needle valve at the front there just enough for the correct flow of fuel to go in to the top there in the metering area which in turn then allows the fuel to be available there in the inlet for the engine to use because we've got plenty there coming down the main jet and there into the venturi so that was under normal working conditions but let's have a look at the other scenario then if we've got a plunger that's too short okay now we've got the shorter plunger and immediately you can see there there's more space between the plunger and the back of that metering lever and now when everything's working and the diaphragm comes down it does so just as quickly and efficiently and it travels the same distance but although it travels the same distance it doesn't push back down as much on the back of that metering lever and that means the front here under the needle valve isn't open quite as much allowing as much flow through so although this diaphragm is stretched down as far as the correct diaphragm would be, because that plunger is shorter, it's not pushing as far down on the back of the metering lever. This is a diaphragm with the correct plunger. You can see there the plunger's longer and there's more flow through allowed there through that spacing. So there'll be enough fuel supply there for the engine. Comparing that scenario again there with the shorter plunger, we can see a big difference there. There'll be less fuel available. And recalling my past experiences, I have actually had a carburetor in the past where I've mistakenly fitted the wrong diaphragm. And whilst I could get the engine to idle or even run on low speed, as soon as I pulled the trigger for high speeds, high revs, it bogged down. And it took me a while to work out the problem, but eventually I did. And I replaced the diaphragm and I was away. And I came to the conclusion this is what was happening. If you can see there, on each cycle of the piston, up and down each time it needs fuel it gets less and less particularly when you open the throttle out we haven't actually got enough fuel there to support high revs because we haven't got the clearance there under the needle valve to allow much fuel through and of course then bog down and it's quite difficult to believe it's all down to that plunger not being the right length and unfortunately it's something that's often overlooked but that's no longer the case now so if you are going to strip down your carburetor and replace all your diaphragms just make sure that this diaphragm is identical in every way to the one you're taking off because that's where the mistakes generally lie it's when we replace the diaphragm because generally the correct diaphragms normally on the carburetor to begin with and as i say it's when we replace the diaphragm where we make mistakes so as long as we make sure that the length of that plunger is correct and the same as the other one you've taken off then we should be okay so let's assume all's well there, so we'll move on now to my eighth reason for bogging down, and that's the metering lever. So just looking once again, it's how the diaphragm interacts with the metering lever. We can see it comes down and it pushes on the back of that lever just enough for the correct amount of fuel to come through, as we've already mentioned. And again, we've already mentioned that there's a correct spacing there between the back of the lever and the diaphragm plunger. Let's now imagine the back of that lever, as you can see there, is low. So it's set too low. Because the lever itself is made of metal, the back of this lever can be set so that the metal can be bent in order to adjust the back of this lever. And sometimes what can happen is this can be set too low. But if that's the case, then this is what happens. It's a similar scenario to having a short plunger. In fact, the result's exactly the same. The needle valve is now not being lifted high enough again, not allowing enough fuel through. So although the diaphragm's now correct and working perfectly, it can't possibly travel down far enough to lift the front there at the needle valve to allow fuel to come through. And the result again is this small gap, which won't allow enough fuel through for high engine revs. And although there's enough fuel available below here, it won't be able to come through that small gap quick enough to feed the top of the metering area here. And then of course, as we've already explained, there'll be less available for the main jet here. And then of course, in turn, there'll be less available for the engine. So taking a look at the working scenario here, 
It's the same outlook as the last scenario. Each time the piston cycles, we've got less fuel going in. Each time the engine revs high. So eventually we've got bogged down. And in this case, it's all because that lever is angled too far low at the back. Again, this is another thing that's often overlooked. So if you do suspect that your metering lever is over adjusted like this, then it's easy enough to bend back into the right area because it's only made of a thin metal. Now the correct setting for these do vary between different types of carburetor. Some you have to adjust as far up as level with the top of the carburetor body and some have to be flush with the bottom of the metering body. But it's not my intention in this particular video to go into how to adjust these exactly. I just wanted to show you how they relate to bogging down, but I will put a video on regarding the adjustments. And in fact, I've noticed that there's already a lot of great content out there on YouTube about how to adjust these. So now let's say we've got the metering lever setting correct. And my number nine reason for bogging down is metering spring. So here's the metering spring. And the trouble we normally have with metering springs are when we replace them. So we'll go out and buy a new diaphragm kit and we'll replace the diaphragms. And if there's no spring in with the diaphragm kit, sometimes what can happen is we can source springs from elsewhere. And those springs are not correctly sprung, if you like. They can be too hard, the spring can. This, of course, isn't so in all cases. And sometimes we can get the right spring by sourcing it from elsewhere. But I have had scenarios in the past where I have fitted springs that look identical to the one I've taken out in every way, but they're a little a little less springy, if you like, they're a little stronger. And that's caused problems. Take a look at this scenario, for example. The diaphragm has come down to the back of the lever, and because that spring is too hard, it won't push the back of the lever down any further than this. And so we're not getting a full range of movement for the diaphragm. And what we're ending up with is this. The diaphragm's moving up and down, but we're only getting a small amount of movement there on the needle valve, which of course is not sufficient whatsoever. So again, it's another one of those scenarios where the diaphragm itself is in good order and it's working correctly. And the spacing between the diaphragm and the back of the lever is correct. And everything else is fine, but because that spring's not correct, we're getting the problems we're getting. We're not getting movement here on this needle valve to allow fuel to come up through and be sufficient enough to run the engine. I've just used the air and fuel in the center of the carb there just to illustrate my next point. But in this scenario, there wouldn't be that much available. But if the engine run at all, then there might be enough for idling speed. But if you pull the trigger, this is what would happen and open up the throttle. There'd be less and less and less and less. And then of course, as always, as the engine demands more fuel, bog down and the engine's most likely to stop. Okay, now we've dealt with any potential issues with the spring, we can move on now to the barrel gasket or the pot gasket as it's well known. And that's my number 10. To best explain this, I just wanna show this very basic drawing here of a two-stroke engine. It's not my intentions to go into detail about how a two-stroke engine works, by the way, because there is another video I've got on about that. And if we just look into the basic workings, first of all, again, we've got air, and fuel mixture that comes in here through the inlet. This is after the carburetor. And as the piston goes up, it draws the air fuel mixture underneath it. And then without going into too much detail, that mixture is then taken to the top of the piston and used for combustion. And in order to achieve that, all of these areas here have to be totally airtight to keep that mixture in with no leaks whatsoever. Even the inlet manifold, which is here, which connects the carburetor to the barrel has to be completely airtight between the two. But the barrel gasket sits somewhere here and that's at the split junction between the barrel and the crankcase beneath it. And of course it's at this point we can separate the barrel from the crankcase to do any repair works. And this is a typical barrel gasket for a, a small two-stroke engine like this. These can be made from like a papery cardboardy type material, sometimes a metal. And as I've mentioned, they keep the seal between the barrel here and the crankcase. And it's vital that these gaskets are in good order, because if they're not, then each time the piston goes up to draw in air fuel mixture, it can also draw in air if there's any damage around that gasket. And as we covered earlier, the air fuel mixture is correct for the running of the engine and any extra air, as you can see coming in there, upsets that air fuel mixture and we've got too much air in now to fuel. And so 
the air mixture to fuel mixture there is making the fuel mixture weak. And as we've covered, everything at the bottom of the piston is transferred to the top for combustion. And the problem is, once all that is transferred to the top with the weak mixture, then we've got a weak mixture there for combustion. That, of course, isn't going to combust efficiently, particularly at high revs, so it would create bog down. We'd get the same problem, by the way, if the bolts were loose that held the crankcase to the barrel. Admittingly, there is a lot more work involved in replacing these gaskets. So before you go stripping the engine right down, it's best to be sure that it is this gasket. But if you've gone through all the steps we've mentioned beforehand, then it could well be a barrel gasket. But of course, if there's one thing I've learned through all my years of repairing engines is that they'll always throw a new one in, as in they'll always throw something new in for you to try and resolve something you've never come across before. So this is more of a guide. OK, so that brings me on nicely to my number 11, which is the crankshaft seals or the main seals, as they're well known. And the main seals, of course, are here and it's where the crankshaft sticks out of the crankcase. And to better explain this point, I'll need a view from this angle. So I'll turn this engine round so we can see this face. There we go. And again, it's just a very basic drawing. It's showing more or less the same components. We've got the crankshaft here sticking out the crankcase. And as you can see, we've got the air fuel mixture just the same. And it goes up to the top of the piston there. But the emphasis on this point is this area here. These are the main seals and they keep in the pressure, if you like, inside the crankcase. So we've got the crankshaft sticking out there both sides. But the main seals here keep the pressure inside. And of course they do so whilst allowing the crankshaft to turn the flywheel. There is only one crank seal on each side of the crankcase, by the way. I've only put two arrows on each side to indicate the span of my crank seal on my drawing. And as I've said, the job of the crank seal is to keep an airtight seal there on the shaft, right there where the arrow's pointing. And it keeps all of this fuel and air mixture within the crankcase here. So it prevents this vital fuel air mixture there from escaping, but also it prevents any air being drawn in in that area. Because as we know, when the piston goes up, it creates a vacuum behind it. And if those seals aren't working correctly or they're damaged in any way, it can draw air into the crankcase there. And of course, we know what that's going to do. It's going to mess around with that special fuel air mixture. There's going to end up being too much air there to fuel and it's going to weaken the mixture. As the piston reciprocates, we're going to get more and more air coming through. And of course, all of the fuel air mixture is destined to go to the top of the piston for combustion. And if that mixture is not correct, then combustion isn't going to take place correctly. And in this case, it's simply all down to these seals leaking. And it's something that's often overlooked. And I have found this particular issue a little more common in the past. I've had this quite a few times. But ultimately, because of the extra air that's coming in where it shouldn't do, weakening the fuel air mixture, it will lead to bog down. One way to diagnose and be sure if you suspect crank seals are leaking is to use a pressure tester. Now, it's not my aim to go into how to use a pressure tester in this particular video, but basically a pressure tester can be used to pump in air into the cylinder and the crankcase. And as it's pumped in, the needle on the gauge there will rise, indicating all the pressure that's inside now the crankcase and the cylinder area. And then when enough pressure has been pumped in, Viewing the gauge to see whether it stays still, whether the needle stays still on the gauge or whether the needle drops will tell us whether we've got a leakage or not. So if, it, if the needle stays still, then it's holding pressure and all's OK. But if the needle drops, then we're losing air. But admittingly, the pressure gauge can also indicate leakages elsewhere, such as the barrel gaskets. So it's not just the main seals that it can reveal the leaking. Now, there is a little trick I've done in the past to save using one of these pressure gauges is when I've had the engine running and it's bogging down, I've sprayed around the crank seals with some light oil. And if the bog down sound starts to subside and engine rev increase again, then that's because it's drawing in some of that light oil there through the crank seals. And I know it's not fuel, but light oil can combust similar to fuel in the presence of air that's atomizing it. So withdrawing in that oil, it's almost correcting the mixture and making the engine rev sound slightly better. 
Now this is only a method of diagnosis, it's not a method of treatment, so we can only do this for a very, very short time. I mean, this is something I've done. I'm not telling you to do it, I'm just telling you what I've done in the past. But it's always worked okay for me. I've always known by doing this whether I've actually got crank seal problems or not, because it directs it straight to the source of the problem. So in the past, when I've had bogged down issues, when I've pulled the trigger on the throttle and it started to go aww, and what I've done is, I've done this, I've sprayed it with light oil, and if the engine revs have raised again slightly, then it's indicated to me that it's drawn in oil in through them seals, and I know then that them seals are leaking. That's what I've done in the past, and it's worked for me. I personally have never had any side effects for the engine doing this, but it's up to you if you want to try this. And that leads me on nicely to my very last cause of bog down, and that's stale fuel. Now the whole issue of stale fuel can be somewhat controversial. Some people say that fuel can go stale in a short amount of time. Some people say it lasts much longer. But in my personal opinion, anything over four to six weeks, and we really need to be replacing the fuel. That's just my own experience. But that said, I have used fuel in the past, which I know is far older than that, and it's still been okay. But then I've used other fuel, that's been around six weeks old and it's been absolutely a waste of time. And that's why the subject of fuel is so controversial because other people have had the similar experiences as I've had. And generally it just leads to confusion. But for many years now, and because I've had many years of experience with this, I do make a habit of never keeping my fuel, untreated fuel that is, for anything more than six weeks at a time. I just find that I always have machines that are running so much better and I know that I'm giving them the best kind of fuel I can give them if you like. But let's just have a look at why we need to keep the fuel fresh. If we could just have x-ray vision now and look into this can. So we've got the fuel at the bottom here in red of course and what tends to happen is from the minute we go and fill the fuel can up from the fuel station the reactive part of the fuel because it has two general parts the reactive parts that we can see there start to evaporate. And as it evaporates, and evaporates over time, it starts to leave behind the non-reactive substance, or rather the less reactive substance. But in any case, evaporation starts to take place and there's nothing we can do about that. And as you can see now, the state of the fuel, it starts to go thick and more like a gum. And what's left behind is something that's not as combustible as it was when we first bought it. Because as we can see there, all the reactive component of that fuel is now gone. So the octane rating, if you like, isn't as high. And so combustion won't take place as efficiently without that reactive component. There are ways to combat this, like keep the fuel tank cap nice and tight to make it last as long as possible. That's something that I hear some people have had success with. And when we fill the cans full of fuel, it's apparently best to fill them to the top particularly if we're storing them for a while. So there's no space here at the top because if there's space here, then there's space for the reactive substance to evaporate into. And of course we don't want that, but filling this gap is supposed to reduce the evaporation. Now one method I always use, and this is something I, I do sing praises about, is to use a fuel stabilizer. They're cheap enough, you can get them off the internet and you can put a good fuel stabilizer into the can with the fuel and keep it fresh for up to two years. And I find that the best way of storing fuel. And stale fuel, by the way, is an odd one for me. In the past, I've used stale fuel and it's caused bog down in my machines. And on other occasions, I've used stale fuel and it's caused flooding. So that's why I've put that down as a cause for bog down, because in the past it has caused that for me. And I just attribute the reasons for that as because this less combustion ability of the fuel if you like because its goodness has evaporated away and left behind that gum. And so now I want to thank you so much for watching the whole of this video. I realise it's been quite extensive and quite long. I wanted it to be that way as I've said because I wanted it to be more of a crash course if you like. I wanted to show an understanding of what's going on in the engines and in the carburettors so that with an understanding things will be remembered better and I just wanted to teach as much as I could teach and pass on my knowledge. Thank you for watching.